Let's get right into our message today. I'm preaching a series. We've been in it for seven weeks. Uh, I want you to get your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 41. We're going to continue this series, Dream to Destiny. This is the seventh message in the series. I'm still trying to figure out why God had me preach about Romans 5 at 9 a.m. and something totally different at 11. But, but God has a plan. And I want you to know this. At 9 a.m. this morning, we had people at the altar that God was doing a work in their hearts and lives. So maybe it was just for them. And I'd rather see one of you get your heart right with God today than me, than me stick to my agenda and my plan. Okay? Genesis chapter 41. Now let me give you a, a quick review of what we've covered the last few weeks, okay? Okay, week one, we, we covered the pride test. And, 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 and that's the test we take when the dream comes, okay? Or in other words, how do you respond to the dream that God gives you for your life, okay? And then the next week we talked about the pit test. And, and that's the test we take when the enemy comes against us. Uh, in, in other words, Satan attacks us and he'll even fabricate evidence against us. That's the test we take when the enemy comes against us. The pit test. And then we talked about the palace test. And, and that's the test we take in, in how we steward what belongs to someone else. In other words, it's the test of stewardship. By the way, one guy on Facebook this week said, there's just no way you can do anything to be blessed. He said, there's not one thing you can do to be blessed. Jesus paid the price. And he's right. See, Jesus paid the price for us to be blessed. But there are some things we can do to be blessed. We can get up and go to work. We can be a good steward of the money that God gives us. There's many things we can do. I believe the test that most of us fail on a regular basis is the stewardship test. How am I stewarding my family? How am I stewarding my role as a husband or as a dad or as a pastor or the financial leader of my home? There's a lot of tests that we need to pass. That's why we preach message series like this to help us grow. I'm growing through this series, and I hope you are too. So the the palace test is how how we how well we steward what belongs to someone else. And, and obviously everything we we have belongs to the Lord. So it's a test of stewardship. Okay? And then the purity test, this is how how well we can steward our own body. That's the test of moral purity. How's that working for you? How, how, how are you passing that test? And then the prison test, which is how, how do we respond? I'm sorry, guys. We forgot to change up that. So, you ready? <laughs> how well do we respond? The prison test is how well do we respond when we do the right thing, but the wrong thing happens. In other words, it's the right thing with the wrong consequences. Has that ever happened to anybody besides me? You do the right thing, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the wrong consequences result from it. And I'm apologizing publicly to you what happened last week. I hope you'll forgive us. That was a slip up on our part, okay? And him and I know what we're talking about. The rest of you just need to trust God. And then, the prophetic test. Oh, God's Word. How are we allowing God's Word to mold us for the prophecy that God's spoken over our lives? In other words, I told you last week, God's Word is the ultimate test of that prophecy. And this week, we're going to talk about the power test. Now, now the power test is is when we step into God's destiny. This is what happens when we step into God's destiny for our life. And, and this happened in Joseph's life when Joseph was about 30 years old. So you got Pharaoh, he had these two dreams, and, and Joseph interpreted those dreams. 
And then Joseph stepped into his destiny, okay? Now, he hasn't fulfilled his destiny yet. So, I want, what I want you to understand, if, if you're walking in the destiny that God has for you, you're still taking a test. I'm, in, I'm walking in the destiny that God has for me, but I'm taking tests every day. All of us are taking tests every day. Now, I believe this is the first test we take when we step into our destiny, or, or the destiny that God has for our lives. Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 41. Now, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but you're going to get the nuts and bolts of the story. And, and this is right after Pharaoh has had two dreams in verses 1 through 7. That Verses 1 through 7 list his dreams. And now let's look at verse 8. This is Genesis chapter 41, verse 8. Now it came to pass in the morning, everybody at Genesis chapter 41, verse 8? Okay, if you're not, you can watch it on the screen. It came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, that, that speaking of Pharaoh, his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and, and Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Verse 9. Now, then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. Uh, in other words, he tells him about Joseph, okay? And, and now jump down to verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly. <laughs> It's very important to understand that the power test comes quickly. So they brought him quickly out of the dungeon and he shaved, changed his clothes, clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Now look at verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a man as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Now I want you to notice, even an unbeliever recognizes God's Spirit in a person. Okay? I picked up a hitchhiker this week and he recognized God's Spirit within me. I mean, and, you know, we had a great time for about 45 minutes, but... Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God show, has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and he clothed him in his garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he, which he had and they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he sent him over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all of the land of Egypt. Now, I want you to notice something here. That, that Joseph, he goes to sleep in the palace, or, or in the prison, and, and he wakes up in the prison, and then he gets to the palace, and the very next day he wakes up in the palace. Promotion. I mean, I really believe promotion can come in one day. Promotion can come quickly. In one day, you can step into your destiny. Now, I want you to see all of these tests that, that we've all been going through. I mean, here's the deal. For instance, the pride test. The pride test is how do we respond to the dream... And the power test is how do we respond to the destiny? See, many, many people don't understand that you're going to be tested. 
You're going to be tested by success. This is a message for someone here today. You're going to be tested by success. It's one of the tests that many, many people fail. I failed it for years. You know, we can handle the prison test. We've been in the prison so many times, we've almost got comfortable in the prison because we know we're going to get out. And we've got it. And, when, and we, we cry out to God when we're in the prison. And then when He gets us out, we say, God, I got it from here. I can handle it from here on out, God. Things are going well. And then we get back in prison again. But it's easy for a lot of us to handle the prison test. We can handle the adversity. But when the test of success comes, we're just not ready for that success. Let me give it to you like this. Say with that, that we're a small church, and we're relatively small, and there's this guy that volunteers, and he's not here today, by the way. He got called out to work. But there's this guy that's volunteering and he helps with the parking lot. And he just loves to help the guests find the, the parking spots and to take an umbrella to them and walk them to the door. And, and, and he greets them with a wave and a smile. And, and he's been volunteering in the park, parking lot. And he's doing a great job. and He's got a servant's heart. And all of a sudden the pastor comes to him and says, you're doing such a great job in the parking lot. I'm going to make you the parking lot captain. From now on, you're the parking lot captain. And then the next week, he shows up with a badge, a uniform, and a bullhorn, and a flashlight that looks like it belongs in a Star Wars movie. I just want you to know he's failing the power test. It's gone to his head all of a sudden. Something changed when he got the position. And this is what the power test is. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the power test today. And, and I'm going to give you three points. But I'm going to phrase the points as a question. And I want you to think about it. Here's number one. Number one question. From where does power come? From where does power come? Psalm 62, verse 11. God has spoken once, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to God. So all power comes from God. And if you don't like the guy that's in charge, God put him there. And God can take him out whenever he's ready. All power comes from God. Romans 14 even talks about there's no power in existence. There's no authority that's set up except that God set it up. You don't like the president? Take it up with God. Another scripture is one of my favorites. It's where Jesus is standing before Pilate. And Pilate says this in John chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? In other words, he says, I'm talking to you. Why won't you speak to me? Do you not know that I've got the power to crucify you and I've got the power to release you? I mean, this is Pilate talking to, to Jesus. And I think one of the reasons this is my favorite scriptures is it's got to be one of the funniest scriptures in the Bible because here's the creator of the universe, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and, 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 and he's saying to him, do you not know I've got power over you? I'm surprised Jesus didn't just start laughing. <laughs> you don't know who you're talking to, pal. <laughs> Jesus answered him in verse 11. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Now let me tell you a little bit about the power test. The power test is recognized. It's recognizing that God's blessing and God's power is on our lives as we respond to and do the right thing. 
We have to respond and we have to do the right thing. In other words, the title test is not going either way. You know, uh, you can't say, well, I've done all this. It's, it's, it's my success. It's, it's because of me. But, it, but it's also not going the other way and saying, well, it's all God. It's all God. And a, and a great example of that, bless Linda's heart, we've known her forever. But, and I always pick on her because whoever's close is who I pick on. Mom, you're off the hook today. But almost every Sunday after service, I, I come, Linda will say, Pastor, that was so good. And it would be kind of like me saying, well, Linda, it's all God. And, and you know, she agrees that next week I come off the platform, she says, Pastor, man, that was awesome today. I know, Linda, it's all God. It's just all God. About five or six weeks of that, about the sixth week, Pastor, that was so good. I said, well, it, it's just all God. And Linda says, well, it wasn't that good. <laughs> you know, because if it's all God, it's all good. And it's all perfect. But we got that human element involved. But that's, that, that's, what, that's what the pride test will do. Understanding that we've worked hard. And we have success because we work hard. And God blesses us when we work hard. If the blessing of God wasn't on what we do, then we wouldn't be able to do it. But we responded to God and we walked in obedience. See, I've walked in, in stewardship. I've walked in the principles concerning getting prepared for my messages. I, or I've walked in the principles of finances. Or I've walked in the principles of humility. Or I've walked in the principles of being a servant. But we can come to the place where we've got some false humility. Where I come down, well, it's just all God, Linda. It's just all God. Oh, I the human element too. In other words, people get in the habit of always saying it's all God, it's all God whether they're singing, preaching, playing their instrument, there's a human element. That's how, this is how we pass the pride test. That's false humility. You get the picture? When we just say, oh, all the time, it's just all God, it's all God. No, we got our part too. Okay? So you pass the power test. You understand that you work hard, but you respond to God's voice, but it's still God's power, it's still God's authority, because all power comes from God, right? Let me tell you something else. A lot of people don't realize this, but desire for power comes from God. All power comes from God, but Satan's twisted things and he's caused us to be selfish and self-centered and have a self-centered desire, but the original pure desire for power comes from God. I mean, you've you got to realize you were created in the image of, of an all-powerful God. And when you understand what power is for, that power is not for your good, but power is to help people. That's what power is for. I mean, do you even realize that, that God gave Joseph power? God, God gave Joseph power to feed multitudes of people. God gave Joseph power so that, 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 that God could bless people. And Joseph understood this and he used the power correctly. So when we understand that there is a, a right desire for power, and listen, if you don't think every person has a desire for power, just watch little kids play together. I mean, just watch them. I remember when Grayson was, was little. He'd get all the neighborhood kids lined up and he'd start ordering them around. He'd get a ruler in his hand and he would be, whether he was playing teacher or preacher, he played them both, and he'd get them lined up downstairs. And he'd order them, or, them around. Now, now Grayson was is our youngest child, and he was used to being ordered around by his big brother. And when big brother wasn't around, Grayson wanted to order the little kids of the neighborhood around. And why do we do this? Because there's a natural desire for power and authority that God gives us. See, all power and even the right desire for power comes from God. 
I mean, Jesus even said it to his disciples. If anyone desires to be great in the kingdom, I mean, Jesus says that. He doesn't say, listen, it's a bad thing or it's wrong to be great in the kingdom or it's a bad desire to be great in the kingdom or that's a bad motive. He doesn't say that. He says, anyone that desires to be great in the kingdom, let him be the servant of all. In other words, it's not a wrong thing to desire to be great in the kingdom. I mean, even Timothy and Titus talk about it. If anyone desires the office of bishop or, or an overseer or an elder, then he desires a good thing. And that's what Timothy and Titus said. So if you desire power for the right reason, it's a good thing. So number one is all power comes from God. Would you say amen? Here's number two. To whom does power come? To whom does power come? James chapter 4 verse 10 says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up. Now, let me give you another word for lifting you up. He'll give you power. He'll give you power. He'll give you authority. Another word for that is He'll give you responsibility. And then 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So God gives grace to the humble. And, and, and one aspect of grace is an enabling or an empowering. I mean, that's what grace is. Grace is God enables you or empowers you. It's not just for forgiveness. That's what most of us associate it to. But it's also for an empowering. I mean, you could never walk a holy life unless God empowered you to do so. I would have thought someone would have said amen right there. I mean, can you imagine? I'm going to walk holy this week. And you don't make it till Monday afternoon. You've got to be empowered by the Holy Ghost. Only God can empower you to live a holy life. So who does he give empowerment to? He gives it to the humble. It's very simple. He, just, he gives power to the humble. I'm asking questions from where does it come? Well, it comes from God. And then I'm asking to whom does it come? It comes to the humble. It, I mean, it's amazing to me. Watch how we go from, from being real humble when we start out doing something. And then after we do it for a while, we kind of lose our humility about it. It'd be, like, it'd be like someone saying, the lady that teaches kids church, uh, Pastor Tracy, okay, she teaches kids church every week, and she says, you know, I've been thinking that I'm going to be out of town next week. I'd like you to te teach kids church. And you say, oh, there's just no way I can do that. I've never taught kids church. I wouldn't know where to start. She says, well, look, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the lessons plan. You can work on it a few minutes during the week. You can pray about it, and so you take the lessons plan, and you say, well, I'm going to try. I hope I can do it. I mean, you're, you're, you're a real humble state, and you go study for it. You get a little prepared for it. You come in and teach kids' church, and God just moves in the kids' church room. I mean, God just moves by His Spirit, and God's using you, working through you. And you come out of kids' church, and someone says, man, that was great. And you say, I knew I could do it. I had it in me all along. I mean, that's what we do. <laughs> God just shows up. And He lifts us up. And it's for His purposes. And He blesses us. And He blesses those around us. We go from being full of humility at times to being full of pride. Here's another good example. When Jane and I first started the church, you know, I went through about the first three or four years of just, just like crying all the time because it was like, I just felt so unworthy to be in this role. And I spent all my all the time saying, God, are you sure you got the right guy? You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that, that got a lot better uh, uh, credentials than I had, you know. And... Uh, and so we were just, we were on our knees and, and seeking the Lord and in prayer. And every prophecy that we got from anybody was, 
From different areas of the country, they were all the same. Pastor this church from your knees. Place of humility. And that's what we did. And, and we went on our first fast together. Real, our first real fast. We had just read Jensen Franklin's book on fasting. And uh, we decided that we had heard from God and we were going to fast for 21 days. And the first seven days we were going to do liquids only. And, and I'm hypoglycemic, they, they say. That's what they diagnosed me as. And so if I don't eat, you know, I, I can pass out. I could die, you know. And my king stomach, is it, he likes to be in control. So going on this fast was going to be a walk of faith. And so we began to fast, and we were doing liquids only for the first seven days. And, and it was just, you know, God was speaking and moving through us. And there was just anointing on what God was doing. And, and God was, you know, in, in this place of humility where we were, God was really using us in a powerful way. And, and then the next 14 days, we went into vegetables and fruit only and water. And man, when you haven't eaten anything for seven days, when you can eat your first carrot, it's good, baby. And and then we but but then we went through four eighteen days of vegetables only. It was kind of like a Daniel fast. And, but God was using us, and the services were powerful, and people were getting saved. And we were loading up van loads of kids from Orange Grove and bringing them in. They were getting saved, eight and ten, twelve people every every service getting saved. You were there. Then we were baptizing these kids that, that we were bringing to church and their families had never been to church or, or maybe they were Catholic and they didn't even really know what a relationship with Christ was really like. And So we were having a baptismal service and we had a mom on this side of the room and a dad on this side of the room. They were divorced but God was saving their kids and God was just moving and it was just a powerful time. And I couldn't believe it. It's just unbelievable. We were prophesying over people. And, and even some of those kids today are freshmen in college right now. We're just so great that we've got to be a part of that in their life. But, but then all of a sudden, a year or two goes by. And, you know, and I'm not saying we quit being humble, but this is what happened to me, okay? i got to tell you what, what happens with me so maybe you can apply it to your life. So, so one day I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Lord, I really want you to use me this Sunday. I want to preach from the book of Acts. I want to preach from Acts chapter 2, and I want to walk and preach with the anointing of God like I've seen other great preachers do. And God, I know you're going to lift me up because you're going to make me just like one of those great preachers. And man, I came into church and I was fired up and I was ready to preach from the book of Acts. And I started reading from Acts chapter 2, and I really expected God to just pour out a spirit on the congregation, and I fell flat on my face. Everybody just looked at me. What's wrong with him? Well, all that pride in. I mean, I really did. I I wanted God to move through me my way instead of God's way. You can't always reproduce what God does before. I went from being a humble young pastor to being an expert on the anointing. And I fell flat on my face. Please, you need to understand me. There's a humility that works in us. And the lower we put ourselves, the higher God puts us. The lower we put ourselves, the higher God puts us. You know, pride is ugly. Pride to me, it's so repulsive. If you've ever been around a prideful person, it's ugly and it's repulsive. Have you ever been around someone you wanted to meet so bad, you respected this person, and this person is very successful, and, and all of a sudden you get to meet the person, and, and you get to spend a little time with that person, and all of a sudden you see that they're arrogant, and you think, man, I don't care if I'm ever around them again. I mean, I've, been, I've, I've had that happen. Or have you ever been around a person who's very successful, accomplished a lot, ministers to millions of people every week? I'm talking about Joel and Victoria Osteen. And, and then all of a sudden you get to spend some time with them because her sister's worked for him for 16 years, been his worship leaders. So all of a sudden we get to spend some time with them and then you see the humility that comes from these people. And you see the people around the country attack them viciously, viciously with accusations and they're, they're called all kinds of things 
but they minister to millions of people every week and they're just full of humility and you're attracted to them and you want to be around them more. Or how about this? You've ever been around someone that hadn't accomplished nothing? <laughs> they hadn't been successful at all and they're still prideful. Now that's just stupid to me. <laughs> but pride is foolish and it looks foolish. It kind of looked like, like me that day, walking back and forth on the platform, wanting to be Billy Graham or Rodney Howard Brown or, or Benny Hinn or, or wanting to be anybody but me because I felt like I couldn't bring anything. So I was trying to be someone else. And I got full of pride because God had used me before in a real humble state. So I said, God, we're going to do this again. And this is the way we're going to do it this Sunday. And I fell flat on my face. It looked, pride looks foolish. So who, who does power come? Power comes to the humble. Here's point number three. We're going to get you out of here in just a minute. Why does power come? Why does power come? Why does, why does God give us His power? Or, or, or why does He share His power with someone else? Acts 10, verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Him. See, God gives power to help people. God gives power because He loves people. And God wants to see people healed, and He wants to see people help, and He wants to see people whole. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but this is what I was thinking about. It's kind of like you've got God over here, and He's got all the resources in the world. He's got all the resources in this world and out of this world. He's even got Pluto and Saturn and Mars. God's got all the resources in the world to help people. And then you've got people over on this side, and they're the hurting people. They need help. I mean, they really do. And who do you think God uses? God uses us. God uses us. I mean, you've got this need over here. You've got all the, the hurting people in the world, people that need the gospel preached to them. You've got all the missionaries over here that need to be sent to all, to all over the world. You've got all the church buildings that need to be built. You've got all the restroom renovations that need to be renovated right here. And then, and then you've got, right over here, you've got God. He's got all the resources. In other words, if you put the business analogy in it, you've got all the supply and all the demand. We're in the middle. We're in the middle. God's simply looking for humble stewards that He can channel His resources through and channel His power through. He wants to get all the resources and all the power and all of this blessing to meet all of the need. But He works through people. But God, but, 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 but you need to understand power is for good. His power is for good because His heart is for people. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17 says, Don't say in your heart, My power and my might of hand have gained me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. Now watch this. It is He who gives you the power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So why does God give power that he may establish his covenant? That people can come into a new covenant of grace with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've heard this scripture quoted so many times. It's been quoted over my life so many times. It's God who gives me the power to get well. It's God who gives you the power to get well. But, but you need to understand, He doesn't give you the power to get wealth just so you can have better things. And God's not against nice things. He gives you the power to get wealth so you can bless people. He wants to use you to bless others. It's all through the Scripture. Why in the world would God give us a 40,000 square foot building 
at the entrance to Corpus Christi on the freeway. Why would he give us this so we could tell everybody, come look at our big, nice building and our, and our brand new restrooms. No, he gives it to us so we can impact more people. We've got lots of empty chairs in here. So lost people can come fill them up and get saved. That's why God gives us this building. So we can see lives changed at this altar. Not because of who we are, but because of what He's done. So it's always to establish His covenant. It's, wonder, it's wonderful when people who have been given power use their power to help people. It's, it's kind of like, uh, that's what Joseph did. But we did it too just a few weeks ago. Grayson says, Dad, I have a girl coming from that I went to high school with, Magda Hernandez. God's really changed her life. And she went off to uh, Baylor and got saved the first week in college. And, and God, she's been in college two years and now she's surrendering nine months of her life to go to the mission field. And she wants to come and share her testimony with the church. And, and maybe if we could take a small offering for her, Dad, it'd be great. And then in my spirit, my spirit just left. I said, send her on over here on a Wednesday night. And during worship, I'm standing here praying during worship. She's back there. I don't even know her. And God says, y'all are going to pay the rest of her trip off. And I'm thinking, God, we don't know how much it is. How are we going to do that? What if it's more money than we got? It's there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I don't even have to explain myself. It's amazing, that's work. Thank you so much. We were like about two weeks before her trip. And I was so excited. I couldn't sleep. I was getting stressed. And I was asking her, Magda, how are we going to do it? Magda, what are you going to do? She held my arm and she told me, Mom, you have to have faith in God. <laughs> if God has the will, I'm going to go. Don't be like this. Don't get stressed. Don't get sick. You work so hard. God is going to put me in the right place. He's going to send the right people in my life. You have to believe. Amen. And I have to be honest. In that moment, I mean, I didn't believe 100%. I was like, really, Magda? Is what you're waiting for? I was like, really? We never, we haven't been in another church. I was raised Catholic. And now she's Christian, and we were waiting in another church, and I, I loved it. I never, I haven't, I pass the freeway all the time. I never know about this place, this church, never. When she told me, Mom, I found the pain, Mom. Then she was crying, she was excited, and really, I don't, it's not only the financial support that you guys give us, the chain and, and the life that she's making right now. She told me this, like, Mom, I can be the best doctor, but if somebody has broken heart and broken soul, there's no point for me to do what I love in this life. And it's hard as a mother to send her so far away, but I'm so proud of her, and especially I'm so grateful with God for everything He's done for us. Thank you so Thank much, you. and for all the support and for Thank you. Thank you. That's sweet. Thank you. She's in Baylor. She want, her daughter wants to be a doctor, but what a testimony! I mean, she can go to college, and God can show her in medical school, and she can. She can, she can help someone, she can fix someone medically, but what if someone's got a heart problem? She's got the gospel to give them now. So, but, but my point in all that is we, we had no idea that, that, that God was going to use us to fund her, the, the, the balance of her mission trip. And, and I'm arguing with God and I'm thinking, God, we've got a restroom to renovate here. And how can we give away money that we really don't have? And God says, your job is just to be obedient. I'll take care of the rest. Yeah. So guess what we did? We wrote her a check for, I think, $4,600, $4,700 as a church. That's what your tithes and offerings do. It gets the gospel over into the Middle East. So it's, 
it's about it's about obedience. It's a, it's about God giving us power to help people. If God can get it to us, He can get it through us. Because we're not hanging on to nothing. We're going through life like this. So it's always to establish His covenant. It's wonderful when people who've been given power will use their help, their, use their power to help people. Now that doesn't draw attention to us, or Journey Church, but it talks about how big our God is. I, now here's the deal. I want to wrap this up because I feel like i got a prophetic word over each of you. I feel like uh, I feel like the prophetic word is this. Remember, look at me everybody. Remember where your power comes from. This is the prophetic word for you. Remember that all power comes from God. And listen, just like Magda's mama had to understand, God's going to take care of everything. Whatever you're going through, that's the prophetic word over you. Remember all power comes from God. Remember, God is going to take care of everything. Bow your head.